Okay. okay, this is Athens Speak Out. My name is Robert Whaley, and we are talking about the balance of power for the first six presidents of the United States. These presidents were either born in, in Massachusetts or in Virginia. And George Washington was the first president from Virginia. And John Adams was the second president from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And then we had uh, Thomas Jay Jefferson. No, no, James. Well, his Secretary of State was J James Madison. Well, true, but the third president. All right, the th first president was George Washington. The second president was was uh, John Adams, and the third president was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, and the fourth president was. Uh, was it Madison? James Madison, and then James Monroe, and then John Quincy Adams. Right, and those, those are the first six. Those are the first six presidents, and we are talking about how those six handled the balance of power. Now, what do you mean by the balance of power, Bob? If you see a, a, a scale, you see a seesaw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the balance of power ha is peaceful when, when four powers, five powers, are down on this side and isolate the one that's out of the balance. That's, what, that's out of power, right? right, right so, They're out of power. Right. But the United States, under George Washington, got in the pennant. The, they used to say the sun never set on the on the Brit British, British Empire. British Empire. <laughs> yeah, and that's when the balance of power is right in the middle. Okay, both sides think that they are number one, and that's a very dangerous situation. So the First World War was a disaster because the Germans and the Austrians thought they were number one. And the British, allied to the French, thought they were number one. And of course, Russia was financed by the by the um, by the. Um, was it the Germans? I don't know. There's the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns. All oh, right. Okay. Those are uh, Austrian and uh, Prussian. Right. And those German. are the two big. German powers, okay? And then is the Russian power. The Russians were part of the balance of power because the French and the British needed Russia as a balance against the German army, which was number one. The Germans and the Austrians were, had the most powerful army, and the British, with the aid of the Russians, were able to force the Germ through German powers to fight a two-front war. So that, that's how the balance of power works. So they were fighting both in the West against the French uh, uh, and their allies, the, the British, and in the East against uh, okay. Germany. All right. So then we have the, the seesaw down there. And the balance of power was tipped against France under uh -huh. the Metternich system. France couldn't get any allies. And the four great powers, Austria and Britain, had a natural alliance because the British had no interests in the continent and the Austrians had no interest in the overseas British Empire. Mm -hmm. So that was a natural alliance which isolated the French. And the French couldn't find any ally at the end of the Metternich system, okay? Balance of power. Well, the Metternich set that up 
in the 19th century, right, after the Napoleonic Wars. That's right, that's right. So it dated from like 1815. You know, it ended in 1815. It began in 1789. The French Revolution was a real revolution. The American Revolution was a was really a war of independence among gentlemen powers. Okay, but Metternich decided that democracy is the enemy. They used to say when. France sneezes, there would be a long revolution. Mm -hmm. So there were five great powers with the Metternich system. And the Metternich system kept the peace for a century. From 1815 to 1914. That's right. Approximately. And in 1914, then the First World War broke out. And the point is that the balance was right in the middle, and everybody thought, both of the sides thought they were number one. <laughs> so it was unstable. Uh -huh. So anyway, the American Revolution ended in, in, in 1789, and the French Revolution just began. That's, the, that's the, the tragedy of the First World War, okay? First World War was more significant than the Second World War, okay? Now, my father was drafted in the First World War, but he didn't understand the balance of power. Mm -hmm. He thought that uh, he was just gonna make money. He thought that he would, be, he would, he would make money. He was a truck driver. But when he went, went into the war, he soon discovered the reality of the balance of power. And he used to sing the song, over there, over there, when the Yanks are coming and we won't come back until it's over, over there. <laughs> and then when the, when the war was all over, he said, be it ever so humble, there is no place like home. <laughs> That's because he served in France That's during the First he World hated, War. He hated every day of it. Mm. Okay. Now, I, I think we're getting back now to this balance of power and Washington. And the Jefferson. early presidents. Let's, let's go back over Washington, Jefferson. Early presidents. Washington, Jefferson, and their secretaries of state. The secretary of state of George Washington was Thomas Jefferson. And then when Thomas Jefferson gave it up, he appointed James Madison to be his secretary of state. And then James Madison got into war and that was the what do we call the war of 1812 the war of 1812 came later we're not going to do the 1812 we're just going to talk about washington adams jefferson madison monroe yeah. john quincy adams right those six presidents then that gets us up to about almost 1830. Well, almost that's 1828. The, that's the first I think. six presidents that we're doing now. The ball game was changed by the popular front. The popular see the first presidents were all aristocrats. The Federalist Party was an aristocratic party, and People like the Federalist Washington. Party. Yeah, the Federalist Party, they, they were all established politicians. But Jackson, Andrew Jackson, started the Popular War. Yeah, he came in in 1828 or 1832. Anyway, that, no, Jackson went to Jacksonville. Oh, 
He said, to the victor belongs the spoils. And the balance of power then changed because he had the popular vote. And that changes the name of the game, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they broadened the electorate. They, they let more men vote. At That's first, what they had to be people who, That's right. who owned property. Okay, the Federalist Party was a very aristocratic party. And it was tied, and they had to go down to the... <sighs> Would have been the House of Representatives? No, the, when it was tied, you had to go to the House of Representatives, and right. each state would get one vote. And this was the, this is where, <sighs> the ball game was changed by, 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 uh, okay, so anyway, we get down to, the, we get down to, the, John Quincy Adams. And right, was it in the 1820s? The first six presidents you're talking about. All right, about. all right. We got, I don't think the date is in, we're, we're getting the names of the presidents. Yes. George Washington, John, Thomas, Adams, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Madison, James Monroe, and that was... And John Quincy Adams. And John... Quincy Adams was the end of the first six presidents. Right. Now, that was the balance of power. Now, Jacksonville was the... You mean Andrew Jackson? Andrew Jackson invaded Florida. Right. And he then changed the ball game to a popular front president. Mm -hmm. The victim belongs the spoils. That is another topic for another day. Okay. Okay. Now, but uh, just let's clarify that Florida... Florida was owned by Spain. Yes. It was out of the balance of power. The balance of power went from, from the north to the south started in Massachusetts and then uh, and New Hampshire New, New Hampshire had 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 waterfront so New Hampshire the Connecticut River divided Connecticut from Vermont and went into the Long Island Sound and r ran right through the middle of Massachusetts I mean it still does well I don't care what you're saying about Massachusetts okay Massachusetts is we all know where Massachusetts is, and Massachusetts is the most important state now for the Democrats, okay? The, yeah. ri the river didn't go through Massachusetts, it went between them, down. down. <clears throat> there was, let's, let's talk about the 13 colonies, okay? It was Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York were the states north of Pennsylvania. Right. And Pennsylvania was the keystone state. It was a sort of the separating state between and the Pen north and the south. Anyway, yeah, he said it's also the Quaker state. Yes. And there were 13 colonies, and they went from... New Hampshire down to Georgia. Right. Now, these are the stars and stripes. And the Betsy Ross flag had 13 stars, 13 stripes for the 13 colonies. And they had a little round dot for the, for the stars, and that was the Betsy Ross flag. Okay? Yeah. All right, you got it. Now, what's the next question? Well, I'm not sure uh, what your next uh, comment. All right, I've named the presidents. We've got the, th the 13 colonies. Right. And then we say that the, there's only one Republican Party 
today. But there is the Jefferson Jackson Party because Jackson developed the popular vote and that led to the Civil War. Okay. Right. So the first, the first uh, six presidents were victories for either Virginia or Massachusetts. Basically, right. 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 And New York was one of the 13 colonies, but it was late. It was called the Empire State. Mm -hmm. So what I say is that we have then the balance of power with the first six presidents and the popular vote of, of, of Jackson led to a stalemate and it was up to the House of Representatives to, to tip and this is where the, my friend, the, the, the Ohio River became the new Mason-Dixon line because it, the business on the Ohio River was all with the North. And Tennessee, the business was all with the South. So Tennessee and, and Kentucky were rivals. And when, when, Jesse, when De Jackson gets in there, it's a tie. And the representatives were tipped by, in other words, Well, the Ohio River separates yeah, Ohio, right, the north, right, from right. Kentucky but the, the, in the south. Right. So the Ohio River, the Mason-Dixon line, was established along the southern states between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that we know the difference between the north and the south. Right. All right. Now, what is your question? Well, that that was the uh, result That's of the That's the result Mason of Dixon the balance line. of power in the in the in the First World War. First World War was a stalemate. Who started the First World War? Okay, was the big question. right. Well, that we're getting away from U.S. politics per se. To the First World War was essentially a European war. But the United States was drawn in. Yes, it was. Okay, late. All right, so we're talking about the United States. The balance of power aspect of the United States. And the Metternich system. That was the European system. That was the European system. And the American Revolution led to the French Revolution. Okay. And that's another topic for another day. Yes, but you do point out that the American Revolution is more of a Revolution for independence. That's right. Compared to the French Revolution, right. which was a a real disastrous social revolution. social revolution. A social revolution, a constitutional revolution, a religious revolution, and it ended feudalism and it was far more sweeping. Right. Okay. So we we know what that Metternich system was, but we're not doing the Metternich system. That's for another day. But it tells you what how the balance of power works. It's safe when one side has is, is, is got the majority vote down, down on this side, but when it's in the middle and nobody knows where the balance of power is, that was the disaster of the First World War. Mm -hmm. Because both sides assumed they were number one, and that led to four long years in the trench. Who started the First World War was the big question. Yeah, well, of course, they, they talk about oh, the incident that um, sparked it off, like right. the assassination of the crown prince. All right, now, let me ask you the question. You were born in, uh, you were, well, you were raised in Nevada and in, and, and in, uh, California, California, to an extent, yes. Right. And, and how did you discover the balance of power between the Japanese and the Chinese? You understood that 
from the point of view of Asian history. Right. And the, the Japanese were the bad guys, and then the, at the end of the war, the Japanese became the good guys. And that's when you discovered it. This was in the, the talking about World War II. Yeah, you got your degree right. from Stanford. You had a better degree than I had. Well, on both sides of your family. Well, that could be, but uh, the point is that uh, because I grew up in the West, yes. in Nevada and California, I was more aware of the Pacific. That's it. Than, um, That's than, exactly uh, what the, I was saying. Than the Atlantic. Right. <laughs> Until after I finished college, basically, right. and I came to the East. Okay. So uh, it does make a difference where you grow up. Now you point out that, it. that you grew up on Long, Long Island, Island, which That's is right. part of New York State. And That's right. So of course you're more familiar with it. Now I, actually I was born in New York City. That's the technical point, but, but anyway. But my parents moved to the yes, West when fine. I was just a baby. So. Fine, okay. So you understood the balance of power between Japan and China. And in the First World War, the Chinese were the good guys and the Japanese were the bad guys. And after the war, it switched sides. Well, because we uh, had Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah, I think you're talking about the Second World War. The Second right? World War changed. Right, because of the Japanese were right. definitely our enemies. They okay. were the ones that bombed Pearl Harbor right. so, in December of 1941. Okay, so you originally were hoping to do Chinese history. But yes, you I was interested in But Chinese. you didn't go through with it. You decided to have three MAs, and that's where we met. In, in New York, in, in Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> okay. Yes, at the University of Michigan in that's Ann Arbor. That's, that's how where we, we met. met. And that's 65 years ago, Bob. Fine. Fine. Okay. Have you thought about that time? All right. This is our 65th I know I'm, anniversary. I know year. I'm, yeah, I know I'm 88. I'm going on 89. All right. So I know where I am, and you know where you are. Right. Okay. So. You discovered the balance of power. Yes, I, I studied history as an undergraduate student at uh, Stanford. That was my major was history. Right. And I, I had, uh, just because of the way they set up in those days, we had a lot of required courses when you and I were, were in college, uh, you know, long, long ago. Um, they were more likely to say, well, you have to have a year of U.S. history and you have to have a year of Western civilization history. And uh, they didn't give you a choice, really. Um, yeah, everybody had a Western Civ course. Yeah, to Western Civ. Okay, fine. Yeah. And they did start at different times. Now, I had a Western Civ course that, that began uh, before the time of Christ. But a lot of people have had Western Civ course that began, oh, about the year 10, I was 1, interested 000. in contemporary history. And you were in contemporary history. I did history. no research from, from primary sources after 1927. Uh -huh. Now, I learned history through travel. Okay. Geography plays Ge a big geography role. Geography was one of the factors that led me into history. How did you happen to have this geographic background, Bob? My father was born in Baldwin. No, was raised in Baldwin. That's a place in New York on that Long was, Island. Yeah, the Long Island Railway went from South Shore, started out in Valley Stream, Lindbrook, Rockville Center, Baldwin, Freeport, Mass uh, Massapequa, Massapequa Park, and Amityville. It went along the sea, and the Long Island Railway was electrified there. Mm -hmm. and it was changing from the country to commuters. Okay. Yes, when you were growing up, when it I was, was becoming a commuter territory. Right, right. And the Pennsylvania Railroad Road is a subsidiary. Of, the Long Island Railway is a subsidiary of the Pennsylvania Railway, and it began in Penn Station. Right. And it, went, it went through Brooklyn very quickly, 
and stopped at Jamaica. All trains stopped at Jamaica, and there were four tracks. You could go to the north side, the south shore, the south shore got all the business, then you could go to the Hempstead line, which was the middle one. So you had the people ran against one across three tracks. Some right. So you remember uh, the way it was set right. up at that time and right. the relationship right. to the right. to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, and in relationship to the World's Fair, yeah. the World's Fair of oh, 1939 yes. uh -huh. was the greatest educational institution and my mother was interested in education uh -huh. and she was interested she was a better historian than my father was uh -huh. my father was a better musician so how many times did you go to the new york world's fair i went to the new york world's fair probably over a dozen times really and we saw all of the buildings uh-huh and we went to the polish building we went to the british building which was by far the biggest the swiss building they put see the World War II was on the verge of breaking out. Yeah, it was, it was predicted. 1939. That's right. So they took all of their treasures out. So the British Empire took the, the crown jewels and all of their textile machinery and put, put it out, and the Swiss took all of their stuff out. And so everybody had a big building. Uh -huh. And my mother was most impressed about the Polish building. Oh, really? Because she just thought Poles, oh, well, they're just. Sort, sort of, of people, uh, poor people. Poor people from immigrants. From immigrants, from, but she never realized that Poland was once a great power. Right. <laughs> and that the Polish, the Polish had a, a, a tremendous a very bad constitution, called the free veto. And one veto vetoed it all. That's right. Which is a terrible idea. A terrible idea because the Prussians on one side and the Russians on the other side could, could eliminate Poland in three different bites, 1772, 1792, uh, 1815, they just eliminated Poland from the map. Right, and, and that was... Uh... As you point out, Poland had been a great power until the time, essentially, of the French <clears throat> French Revolution, uh, which changed the map of Europe pretty substantially. Right. Okay, so do you want to say anything more about your understanding of the balance of power? Or is this the... Well, summary of our show. Is this the end of the show? No. <laughs> we still have plenty of time to talk. All right. About other things in, in international well, we talk, history. We can talk more about Chiang Kai-shek, and we can talk more about Mao Zedong. Yes, they and, were the two uh, and we talk about conflicting governments we in talk China. Ab we talk about how... This is, this is the story I have with with Judy Dezo, okay? When we open up, when we go up to the, um, up to the, uh, when we put the table of contents on uh -huh. for the Korean War, okay? Okay, she the Korean a, War began in 1950. That was a surprise. And it was, Time that we remember well because we were That's young right. people. Because this is just finished in this college. This is a rule. This is a rule that Bismarck ha had. Nobody can predict the next war more than three years. That was Bismarck's rule. <laughs> and, because things might change. <laughs> yes, and he had in mind the Crimean War. Uh-huh. Now that was in 1854, as I recall. Uh, at least the... 1855. The, the English were involved there. Right. Nobody predicted that there would be war in Crimea. Crimea is in the Black Sea, and uh, it was uh, It separates area. the Black Sea from the Mediterranean. Right. And there was, they called it Asia Minor and Asia Major. 
to the to the far east yes. of the major ma Asia right, right, major. Right, right. And Portugal was the number one power in the thirteen hundreds because it had the great asset of the river coming out of Spain, the rivers coming out of Spain and Lisbon. Mm -hmm. Prince Henry the Navigator heard that there was a Christian by the name of Prester John uh -huh. who lived on the other side of China and you could, rather than traveling through the Silk Road, which took a long time, you across could, Asia, you, land You route. could go across the water, the water, ocean. and go, go go from Lisbon and, and get yeah. to the so-called Far East. Yeah, and and get get <laughs> get to the Far East. And Christopher Columbus knew that the world was round, and the. Well, Christopher the, Columbus, Christopher Columbus was an Italian, and he thought that by sailing west he could, he could reach get India, the Far East. Yes, he didn't know that two continents existed. Right, right. That's it. So North America and South America were discovered. They later. were in the way, yeah, so to in speak. The way. But anyway, Peter Minuet founded New York. He was Dutch. Dutch, and he founded New Amsterdam. In, in, in 1524. Now, 10 years later, the British Empire was at war with the Dutch mm -hmm. and decided to just eliminate New Amsterdam and call it New York. Right, so they, they took over from the Dutch. Right, and New Albany Amsterdam was made the New capital. York. They bought the Manhattan Island from the Indians for $24 in, in trinkets and chased the Indians north. Well, the Indians came back to a famous place called Wall Street, and the Dutch built a wall. <laughs> And that Wall Street still exists. And gradually the Manhattan Indians go north. Moved and north. And it just appeared, it eventually disappeared off into, of the, into the Mo Mohawks. And, and the, the Manhattan Indians are just, they didn't have had any reservations. They were just lost. They merged into the Mohawks. And that was the end of the Manhattan Indians. But the name Manhattan stayed. And there were five boroughs. Manhattan was one. Manhattan was the most important. Still is. Right. And there was. Because it's where the all the so not the, all but most so of the, the question big is, the question, tall buildings are. The question are. is who owns Manhattan? Okay. <laughs> Lots now, of different corporations. <laughs> no. Well, a lot of people thought the Jews owned Manhattan. No, the Jews owned a lot of big department stores in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And the Jews came over to the United States with technological advancement. Okay. But it's a myth that uh, Manhattan is owned by the Jews. It's an international city. And Mercedes says Manhattan is owned by the British Empire. The British <laughs> still hold all the land there. Yeah. Different countries can, can lay claims. Well, Mercedes has a different view. I was always pro-British. As a, as a, as, you know, my father said he was English, so I thought I was English. In background. Uh -huh. That's right. And nobody in Baldwin spoke about the
Yeah, I'm a little unclear where you're headed. I say the people in New York did not speak about, except Dukakis. Dukakis knew something about the Greeks. Yes, the, because of his Greek background. Yeah, there was no, as far as I know, there was no Greek restaurant in, in New York. So it was through Dukakis that I went to Bates College and then I met Larry Burns at Bates College. And that's how the death of Larry Burns recently has to be announced to everybody that I know as soon as possible. Okay. Yes, we didn't realize until we saw right. in the uh, Bates Alumni Magazine okay. that Larry Burns had moved on. Right. Now, one of the interesting things about Larry Burns is that his uh, name is spelled with an I instead of a U. I think that's an artificial name. Well, I don't know what... Most people named Burns have a U in their name, but yeah. his family has an I instead That's of a right. U, Burns. And he was raised in Ozone Park, a suburb. That's out on Long Island. That's right, but there was no Long Island railroad station there. Mm -hmm. But he visited me in Long Island through a relative of mine by the name of Ethel Cummins. Mm -hmm. And I was working for a Jewish druggist called Nassau, uh, called uh, Nassau County. Uh, this was a drugstore. A drugstore. So, Delivering things on your bike. That's right. <laughs> when you were in high school, this right. was. So Lar Larry ago. Burns and, and uh, Arthur Dawkin came down since I had been admitted to Bates College. Which is in Maine, actually. Which was in Maine. Lewiston. And Burns had a very negative reaction to me. He thought I was the biggest hayseed in the world. But because of this connection with Arthur Dawkin, who was known to my relative called Ethel Kummer, who was a German, uh, that introduced me to... Right, and you and Burns became Burns. friends. Yes, right. Yes. right. Now, Larry Burns visited us in... Right, well, he, he, he visited, visited us right in our own house right now. He went to that... that, that well, stove. That, that, he, he had the wasn't stove. It, wasn't it when we were in uh, Kentucky? Right. I'm trying to remember now. We, we, it's no, a long he, time ago. Forget about Kentucky right now. Larry Burns visited through the dean of Bates College, uh -huh. Ethel Kummer, and Larry Burns came to the pleasant place where we live, where we have the stove. We turn the stove on. Larry Burns visited that place and put, put the stove on and went down there. Well, are you talking about our trailer house? No, I'm talking about where we live now. Where do we live? <laughs> 15. We live at 14 Oak Street. 14 Memphis, Oak Street. Ohio. He came down to 14 Oak Street and went to that, that thing and put the, 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 the thing on and... Heated it up. Okay, well, I, I guess I don't remember that particular e event. Yeah. But anyway, um, it's too bad that Larry Burns has, has moved on, but we did notice that he's uh, left a son. Maybe we'll be able to be in touch with his son, Nicholas. That would be nice. Well, maybe Nicholas wrote that biography. Yeah, there was a little obituary in Somebody the Bates wrote, magazine. But from my point of view, there's a lot of inaccuracies in it. Well, I don't know. It does mention that he had founded the Council on Hemispheric That's Affairs. That's right. Koha, Koha. Called Koha now, for the, uh, the, you know, And the question initials. now is, is Koha under new management? Probably so. Going to continue or is that going to be? Because after all, he was like 
us in his 80s when he passed away. Right. He was, so he probably had retired from Koha okay, sometime. Okay, so Koha before. will be under new management. Yeah. I think that Ohio University will continue to subscribe to it. Yeah, but, but I am no longer interested in it. Well, it's, it, but it's important for uh, Latin American affairs because that's what its purpose was, Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Right. By that they meant the Western Hemisphere, i.e. Right. Right. North and South America. Right, okay. Yeah. So anyway, uh, hopefully COHA will continue its good work in the Western Hemisphere. That's up to them. Yes. Now, you have an opportunity to write your memoirs, which are not yet complete. Well, that's definitely the case. I right. must admit I've uh, written up mostly about my, my youth. <laughs> And haven't gone much beyond uh, the time when I finished college and, and came east. All right. To uh, Michigan, where we met, as we pointed out, 65 years ago this year. Okay, it's so what time. time is it now? Do you want to close off now? Well, I think it may be a little early. I think that uh, Matt Green is keeping an eye on that time for us. So. Well, we, uh, can, we can sign off and say... What, what else are you involved with these days, Bob? I am trying to talk to Alice. That's our daughter. And she has to get these pins from my shoulder. I have pins. Oh, you're talking about your... your buttons. Buttons. Yes. Uh-huh. We got to get... We, she has to go to the thing and... And get the, the pins that say things like... Uh, History can be everything. Right. <laughs> and we have to put on can be in, 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 with a scotch tape. Right. Because the original button says history is everything. No, it can be. And Judy Dazo <laughs> made a report that's too dogmatic and uh -huh. she's correct. So she's persuaded us it would be better right. to say history can be everything. That's right. And what that means is essentially, you know, you can have the history of, of nations, you can have the history of families, you That's can right. have the that's history right. of places. Right. So one way so on of so learning forth. history is through travel, and that's how I learned it. Uh -huh. Another way is to be like a John Gaddis, sit down and you read what other historians have written. Yes. And he came from Texas, and he then inherited a historical father. And if you have a historical father, you can make the next jump to history. Yes, so it's a Arthur lot Swin easier. Uh, there's a famous Harvard joke. Yeah. Here come a gentleman and a scholar. What's the joke about it? The joke is that the gentleman and the scholar who went to Harvard and the gentleman was Arthur Schlesinger Jr. who wrote his M.A. thesis as a book, mm -hmm. the first president. Yes, he was uh, quite a well-known scholar when so we he were was, young. He, was, he got interested in presidential itis, you might say. Mm -hmm. And the scholar was his father, Arthur Schlesinger Sr., who got a job at Harvard teaching American history. Mm -hmm. He was the scholar. So was a gentleman and a scholar. That was the joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, I think the phrase is older because I think that it probably originated in, in England somewhere, sometime okay. or other. <laughs> yeah. 
actually. And then, and then England had another important uh, slogan. It said, some men are born great, many like Some many king, greatness. Yeah, yeah. King Edward, many, lots of King Edwards were born great. <laughs> and some achieved greatness, right. like Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. Uh -huh. And some had greatness thrust upon him. <laughs> and the first example was Harry Truman. Harry Truman. Tram Harry yes. Truman. Yes. Never a, thought he was going to be president of the United only States. Only had only had uh, artillery training in the First World War, but he had to. When Roosevelt died suddenly, he had greatness thrust upon him. Yes. And his wife didn't want him to accept. His wife wanted him to resign, but Truman, being Truman, said, "No, I'm going to." carry out my duties. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and he was a pretty good president. Well, he, he, he was greater than, than he, he, he... Than people thought he would That's be. That's right. He yeah. had greatness thrust upon him. Yes. And he then was supported Roosevelt's Secretary of War, who was interested in oil diplomacy, mm -hmm. and Roosevelt, uh, Truman was faced with a dilemma. The Jews went to both parties and said, will you recognize Israel as a separate state? Mm -hmm. That question came up in the late 40s. That came up at the, at the, when Roosevelt died. Yeah. And, and, uh, but but it became but it became really Truman, very important when right. Israel was, yes, right. was declared. Well, this, this is what, what in eighteen in nineteen forty eight. Clark Clifford did. Clark Clifford said to Truman, "You had better recognize Israel before the Republicans do," and he did that. Yes, and that was in eighteen in nineteen forty eight. Nineteen forty eight. Yeah. When I went to Bates College. Yes, it was it was in the spring of nineteen forty eight when I was a senior in high school. Right. Well, we remember a fair amount of history because we've been around for eighty plus years. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the French Revolution then was a tremendous revolution that went through many, many cycles. Mm -hmm. The 12 who ruled, then it was reduced to five. And then Napoleon emerged. Napoleon proclaimed himself an emperor. And then the king, the Bourbon dynasty, was restored. So it went through the full cycle. Yeah. After, after uh, Waterloo. Yeah. Then there was a second French Revolution, which was very light, in 1830. Yeah. And then there was one in 1848. All right, but let's talk about the 1830 Revolution. Okay. 1830. It only lasted for, it was mostly a student revolution. Mm-hmm. And they changed the name of the Bourbon dynasty to Louis-Philippe and the king of the French. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit different. The king of the French, Louis Philippe. Uh -huh. That gets nationalism. <laughs> it was basically a student revolution. Lasted, lasted for one day. And the big Machiavellian on the side was Talleyrand. Uh -huh. And Talleyrand betrayed every oath he ever had. Well, he was pretty successful at it, that's, that's for sure. And the revolution of 18, at the end, in, well, at the he, end of the First World War, Okay. he, he said, 1918. Well, what, in 1918, he said, I survived. <laughs> Sometimes that's very important to uh, politicians, just yeah. to 
hang on there long enough that they that they survive that they survive uh, hard times and uh, so, opposition. So American foreign policy was tied up with the five great powers of the East of the, of Europe. Yeah, and that included the orthodox powers. We had no Orthodox Church in Baldwin. Orthodox uh, Christianity was in the Eastern Mediterranean for right. the most part. Right. Western Mediterranean was Roman and, Catholic. Yeah, but but we had Still the, is. the the whole. We had the Greek. We had the holy Orthodox Christian Church before there was a Roman church. Yes, there was a split between the two. If That's I right. remember right, it was in the 10th century, basically. In order to be a Christian minister, you have to know Greek. Well, so that was my mother true was, in the old days. That anyway. was true of how the Greek church the Orthodox Church was different from the Roman Catholic Church. And of course the Russians were historically And the Russians Orthodox. were off spot. They, they were off spot, off shoots. Uh, Russian Orthodox. Right, right. So, so Dukakis, as a Greek, had a bigger influence in Massachusetts than they do in New York. Because mm -hmm. the Orthodox who come to New York just are dissolved among hundreds of other little Norton nationalities, like, and and they don't, they, they don't, they don't have that ethnicity outstanding connection, connection anymore. Yeah. Could be, I don't know. That's a modern religious question. Uh, that's how times change the interpretation of Christianity. So, I think this should be the end, don't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> what time we got? Uh, it should be pretty soon because uh, Matt will let us know. That's all for sure. right. Well, then we'll keep chatting about the twelve who ruled who became the directory and then it became three consuls and then Napoleon called himself the first consul. Oh, consul, C-O-N-S-U-L. That's right. Consul. Right, right. Yes, Napoleon outgrew that, he became emperor. Right. And then he, he took the crown off Pope Pius VII and, and claimed himself the emperor of the West. Well, and I think... And made the Holy Roman Empire defunct. Right. Pope Pius was all ready to take the crown off of a cushion, put it on the head of Napoleon, and but he Napoleon grabbed it, grabbed it and he says, put it I on am himself. the emperor of the West. <laughs> He named himself. And then the Napoleon emperor. was was captured, and sent to the island of Elba. And right. then he bribed the guards to escape, and he came back and he fought a hundred days, the Battle of Waterloo. He lost. The, he lost this time in 1815. This time they sent him to Saint Helena, which was farther away. And he there was no place to escape. He couldn't escape. But he was the first international war criminal who served a, his life out, and they let him write his memoirs. And that led to the myth of Napoleon and Napoleon the... Napoleon wrote his own history, you're saying? Yes, the, the, <laughs> the, the tomb of Napoleon. Well, he, it, he had uh, had a pretty successful run around Europe. Right. He, he put uh, some of his relatives right. as kings and queens in right. different countries in right. Europe when he was the top person. 
Yeah. So, so Russia was the downfall of Napoleon because of his space. Yes. And Russia was the downfall of Adolf Hitler because of his space. Well, not just the space, but the fact that it's doggone uh, bad winters there. Well, the space and the winter add up. Yeah, they, they, they uh, defeated both Napoleon and Hitler. Come on, and that's the philosophy of Arnold Toynbee. Because um, uh, the um, people got right to the gates of Moscow. Right. Arnold Toynbee says there are seven... Seven great empires? Seven uh, great, great uh, empires. No, there are seven viable empires today. Oh. But originally, there were 21 civilizations. Okay, 21 and the, civilizations. The Incas and the Aztecs are extinct, and the Mayans yeah. are extinct. Yeah, okay. The Hittites are extinct. Right. But there are seven viable civilizations today. Mm -hmm. the, Which made him one of the greatest historians of our well, youth. When well, we were yeah, young. I'm, I'm much impressed by him. And... <clears throat> These seven viable civilizations are Hebrew civilization, Western civilization, which is a combination, which was invented by the French, which is a combination of the Jews and the Christians. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Islamic civilization, Mesopotamia. Well, the Islamic civilization got around about 1600 A. Pardon yeah, me, six, 600 A. 622 AD. is the is the birth of yeah, Islam. because that's but when Islam that, was. But before that, there was Mesopotamia. Yeah. Two Muhammad. Rivers. Yeah, two rivers: Tigris and Euphrates. But Muhammad. Uh, and it went down to Babylon. Babylon was the capital of the Chaldean Empire. Well, that was that was pre-Christian, long time ago. That's right. And in fact, the Jews uh, were taken away from the land which today we call Israel. Were taken away to Babylon for seventy-five years. That was the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, it's about five hundred B.C. or something like that. And then finally, they got. They were able to go back to their homeland. So there were two, two books written by women. Ruth was one, and Esther was another one. Yes, the two books of the Bible, the Old Testament, which uh, include the stories of Ruth and Esther. Right. Okay. <laughs> I guess we're ready to close <laughs> off. <laughs> Well, we've gotten back with the <laughs> ancient history here. And this is Athens Speak Out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we... We're signing off now. We're yeah. signing off. Lois Whaley and Robert Whaley. <laughs>